Chapter Twenty of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Perry. Chapter Twenty. Of all the enigmas which ever confronted a girl, there can have been seldom one like that which followed Henchard's announcement of himself to Elizabeth as her father. He had done it in an ardor and an agitation which had half carried the point of affection with her yet behold from the next morning onwards his manner was constrained as she had never seen it before the coldness soon broke out into open chiding one grievous failing of elizabeth's was her occasional pretty and picturesque use of dialect words those terrible marks of the beast to the truly genteel it was dinner-time they never met except at meals and she happened to say, when he was rising from table, wishing to show him something, If you'll bide where you be a minute, father, I'll get it. Bide where you be, he echoed sharply. Good God, are you only fit to carry wash to a pig trough that ye use such words as those? She reddened with shame and sadness. I meant stay where you are, father, she said in a low, humble voice. I ought to have been more careful. He made no reply, and went out of the room. The sharp reprimand was not lost upon her, and in time it came to pass that for Fay she said succeed, that she no longer spoke of Dumbledores, but of humble bees, no longer said of young men and women that they walked together, but that they were engaged, that she grew to talk of Greggles as wild hyacinths, that when she had not slept she did not quaintly tell the servants next morning that she had been hagrid, but that she had suffered from indigestion. These improvements, however, are somewhat in advance of the story. Henchard, being uncultivated himself, was the bitterest critic the fair girl could possibly have had of her own lapses, really slight now, for she read omnivorously. A gratuitous ordeal was in store for her in the matter of her handwriting. She was passing the dining-room door one evening and had occasion to go in for something. It was not till she had opened the door that she knew the mayor was there in the company of the man with whom he transacted business. "'Here, Elizabeth Jane,' he said, looking round at her. "'Just write down what I tell you, a few words of an agreement for me and this gentleman to sign. I am a poor tool with a pen.' be jowned and so be i said the gentleman she brought forward blotting-book paper and ink and sat down now then an agreement entered into this sixteenth day of october write that first she started the pen in an elephantine march across the sheet it was a splendid round bold hand of her own conception a style that would have stamped a woman as minerva's own in more recent days but other ideas reigned then. Henchard's creed was that proper young girls wrote ladies' hand. Nay, he believed that bristling characters were as innate and inseparable a part of refined womanhood as sex itself. Hence, when, instead of scribbling, like the Princess Ida, in such a hand as when a field of corn bows all its ears before the roaring east, Elizabeth Jane produced a line of chain-shot and sandbags, he reddened in angry shame for her, and peremptorily saying, Never mind, I'll finish it, dismissed her there and then. Her considerate disposition became a pitfall to her now. She was, it must be admitted, sometimes provokingly and unnecessarily willing to saddle herself with manual labors. She would go to the kitchen instead of ringing, not to make Phoebe come up twice. She went down on her knees, shovel in hand, when the cat overturned the coal scuttle. Moreover, she would persistently thank the parlour-maid for everything, till one day, as soon as the girl was gone from the room, Henchard broke out with, Good God, why doesn't leave off thanking that girl as if she were a goddess born? Don't I pay her a dozen pound a year to do things for me? Elizabeth shrank so visibly at the exclamation that he became sorry a few minutes after, and said that he did not mean to be rough. These domestic exhibitions were the small protruding needle-rocks which suggested rather than revealed what was underneath, but his passion had less terror for her than his coldness. 
the increasing frequency of the latter mood told her the sad news that he disliked her with a growing dislike the more interesting that her appearance and manners became under the softening influences which she could now command and in her wisdom did command the more she seemed to estrange him sometimes she caught him looking at her with a lowering invidiousness that she could hardly bear not knowing his secret it was cruel mockery that she should for the first time excite his animosity when she had taken his surname but the most terrible ordeal was to come elizabeth had latterly been accustomed of an afternoon to present a cup of cider or ale and bread and cheese to nance mockridge who worked in the yard wimbling hay bonds nance accepted this offering thankfully at first afterwards as a matter of course on a day when henchard was on the premises he saw his stepdaughter enter the hay barn on this errand and as there was no clear spot on which to deposit the provisions she at once set to work arranging two trusses of hay at the table mockridge meanwhile standing with her hands on her hips easefully looking at the preparations on her behalf elizabeth come here said henchard and she obeyed why do you lower yourself so confoundedly he said with suppressed passion haven't i told you all it fifty times hey making yourself a drudge for a common workwoman of such a character as hers why you'll disgrace me to the dust now these words were uttered loud enough to reach nance inside the barn door who fired up immediately at the slur upon her personal character coming to the door she cried regardless of consequences come to that mr henchard i can let he know she've waited on worse and she must have had more charity than sense said henchard oh no she hadn't twere not for charity but for hire and at a public house in this town it is not true cried henchard indignantly just ask her said nance folding her naked arms in such a manner that she could comfortably scratch her elbows henchard glanced at elizabeth jane whose complexion now pink and white from confinement lost nearly all of the former color what does this mean he said to her anything or nothing it is true said elizabeth jane but it was only did you do it or didn't you where was it at the three mariners one evening for a little while when we were staying there nance glanced triumphantly at henchard and sailed into the barn for assuming that she was to be discharged on the instant she had resolved to make the most of her victory henchard however said nothing about discharging her unduly sensitive on such points by reason of his own past he had the look of one completely ground down to the last indignity elizabeth followed him to the house like a culprit but when she got inside she could not see him nor did she see him again that day convinced of the scathing damage to his local repute and position that must have been caused by such a fact though it had never before reached his own ears henchard showed a positive distaste for the presence of this girl not his own whenever he encountered her he mostly dined with the farmers at the market-room of one of the two chief hotels leaving her in utter solitude could he have seen how she made use of those silent hours he might have found reason to reserve his judgment on her quality she read and took notes incessantly mastering facts with painful laboriousness but never flinching from her self-imposed task she began the study of latin incited by the roman characteristics of the town she lived in if i am not well informed it shall be by no fault of my own she would say to herself through the tears that would occasionally glide down her peachy cheeks when she was fairly baffled by the portentous obscurity of many of these educational works thus she lived on a dumb deep-feeling great-eyed creature construed by not a single contiguous being quenching with patient fortitude her incipient interest in farfrae because it seemed to be one-sided unmaidenly and unwise 
True that for reasons best known to herself, she had, since Farfrae's dismissal, shifted her quarters from the back room, affording a view of the yard, which she had occupied with such zest, to a front chamber overlooking the street. But as for the young man, whenever he passed the house, he seldom or never turned his head. Winter had almost come, and unsettled weather made her still more dependent upon indoor resources. But there were certain early winter days in Casterbridge, days of firmamental exhaustion which followed angry southwesterly tempests, when, if the sun shone, the air was like velvet. She seized on these days for her periodical visits to the spot where her mother lay buried, the still-used burial-ground of the old Roman British city, whose curious feature was this, its continuity as a place of sepulture. Mrs. Henchard's dust, mingled with the dust of women who lay ornamented with glass hairpins and amber necklaces, and men who held in their mouths coins of Hadrian, Posthumus, and the Constantines. Half-past ten in the morning was about her hour for seeking this spot a time when the town avenues were deserted as the avenues of Karnak. Business had long since passed down them into its daily cells, and leisure had not arrived there. So Elizabeth Jane walked and read, or looked over the edge of the book to think, and thus reached the churchyard. There, approaching her mother's grave, she saw a solitary dark figure in the middle of the gravel walk. This figure, too, was reading, but not from a book, the words which engrossed it being the inscription on Mrs. Henchard's tombstone. The personage was in mourning, like herself, was about her age and size, and might have been her wraith or double, but for the fact that it was a lady much more beautifully dressed than she. Indeed, comparatively indifferent as Elizabeth Jane was to dress, unless for some temporary whim or purpose, her eyes were arrested by the artistic perfection of the lady's appearance. Her gait, too, had a flexuousness about it, which seemed to avoid angularity. It was a revelation to Elizabeth that human beings could reach this stage of external development. She had never suspected it. She felt all the freshness and grace to be stolen from herself on the instant by the neighborhood of such a stranger. And this was in face of the fact that Elizabeth could now have been writ handsome, while the young lady was simply pretty. Had she been envious, she might have hated the woman, but she did not do that. She allowed herself the pleasure of feeling fascinated. She wondered where the lady had come from. The stumpy and practical walk of honest homeliness which mostly prevailed there, the two styles of dress thereabout, the simple and the mistaken, equally avouched that this figure was no Casterbridge woman's, even if a book in her hand resembling a guide-book had not also suggested it. The stranger presently moved from the tombstone of Mrs. Henchard and vanished behind the corner of the wall. Elizabeth went to the tomb herself. Beside it were two footprints distinct in the soil, signifying that the lady had stood there a long time. She returned homeward, musing on what she had seen, as she might have mused on a rainbow or the northern lights, a rare butterfly or a cameo. Interesting as things had been out of doors, at home it turned out to be one of her bad days. Henchard, whose two years' mayoralty was ending, had been made aware that he was not to be chosen to fill a vacancy in the list of aldermen, and that Farfrae was likely to become one of the council. This caused the unfortunate discovery that she had played the waiting-maid in the town of which he was mayor to rankle in his mind yet more poisonously. He had learnt by personal inquiry at the time that it was to Donald Farfrae, that treacherous upstart, that she had thus humiliated herself. And though Mrs. Stanage seemed to attach no great importance to the incident, the cheerful souls at the Three Mariners having exhausted its aspects long ago, such was Henchard's haughty spirit that the simple, thrifty deed was regarded as little less than a social catastrophe by him. 
Ever since the evening of his wife's arrival with her daughter, there had been something in the air which had changed his luck. That dinner at the King's Arms with his friends had been Henchard's Austerlitz. He had had his successes since, but his course had not been upward. He was not to be numbered among the aldermen, that peerage of burghers, as he had expected to be, and the consciousness of this soured him to-day. "'Well, where have you been?' he said to her with off-hand laconism. "'I've been strolling in the walks and churchyard, father, till I feel quite leery.' She clapped her hand to her mouth, but too late. "'This was just enough to incense Henchard after the other crosses of the day. "'I won't have you talk like that,' he thundered. "'Leery, indeed. One would think you worked upon a farm. One day I learn from you that you lend a hand in public houses, then I hear you talk like a clodhopper. I'm burned. If it goes on, this house can't hold us too. The only way of getting a single pleasant thought to go to sleep upon, after this, was by recalling the lady she had seen that day, and hoping she might see her again. Meanwhile Henchard was sitting up, thinking over his jealous folly in forbidding Farfrae to pay his addresses to this girl who did not belong to him, when, if he had allowed them to go on, he might not have been encumbered with her. At last he said to himself, with satisfaction, as he jumped up and went to the writing-table, "'Ah, he'll think it means peace and a marriage portion, not that I don't want my house to be troubled with her and no portion at all.' He wrote as follows. Sir, on consideration I don't wish to interfere with your courtship of Elizabeth Jane, if you care for her. I therefore withdraw my objection, excepting in this, that the business be not carried on in my house. Yours, M. Henchard. Mr. Farfray. The morrow, being fairly fine, found Elizabeth Jane again in the churchyard, but while looking for the lady she was startled by the apparition of farfrae who passed outside the gate he glanced up for a moment from a pocket-book in which he appeared to be making figures as he went whether or not he saw her he took no notice and disappeared unduly depressed by a sense of her own superfluity she thought he probably scorned her and quite broken in spirit sat down on a bench she fell into painful thought on her position, which ended with her saying quite loud, Oh, I wish I was dead with dear mother. Behind the bench was a little promenade under the wall, where people sometimes walked instead of on the gravel. The bench seemed to be touched by something. She looked round, and a face was bending over her, veiled but still distinct, the face of the young woman she had seen yesterday. Elizabeth Jane looked confounded for a moment, knowing she had been overheard, though there was pleasure in her confusion. "'Yes, I heard you,' said the lady in a vivacious voice, answering her look. "'What can have happened?' "'I don't—I can't tell you,' said Elizabeth, putting her hand to her face to hide a quick flush that had come. There was no movement or word for a few seconds. Then the girl felt that the young lady was sitting down beside her. I guess how it is with you, said the latter. That was your mother. She waved her hand towards the tombstone. Elizabeth looked up at her as if inquiring of herself whether there should be confidence. The lady's manner was so desirous, so anxious, that the girl decided there should be confidence. It was my mother, she said, my only friend. But your father, Mr. Henchard, he is living. Yes, he is living, said Elizabeth Jane. Is he not kind to you? I've no wish to complain of him. There has been a disagreement. A little. Perhaps you were to blame, suggested the stranger. I was, in many ways, sighed the meek Elizabeth. I swept up the coals when the servants ought to have done it, and I said I was leery, and he was angry with me. The lady seemed to warm towards her for that reply. "'Do you know the impression your words give me?' she said ingenuously. "'That he is a hot-tempered man, a little proud, perhaps ambitious, but not a bad man.' 
her anxiety not to condemn henchard while siding with elizabeth was curious oh no certainly not bad agreed the honest girl and he has not even been unkind to me till lately since mother died but it has been very much to bear while it has lasted all is owing to my defects i dare say and my defects are owing to my history what is your history elizabeth jane looked wistfully at her questioner she found that her questioner was looking at her turned her eyes down and then seemed compelled to look back again my history is not gay or attractive she said and yet i can tell it if you really want to know the lady assured her that she did want to know whereupon elizabeth jane told the tale of her life as she understood it which was in general the true one except that the sale at the fair had no part therein contrary to the girl's expectation her new friend was not shocked this cheered her and it was not till she thought of returning to that home in which she had been treated so roughly of late that her spirits fell i don't know how to return she murmured i think of going away but what can i do where can i go perhaps it will be better soon said her friend gently so i would not go far now what do you think of this i shall soon want somebody to live in my house partly as housekeeper partly as companion would you mind coming to me but perhaps oh yes cried elizabeth with tears in her eyes i would indeed i would do anything to be independent for then perhaps my father might get to love me but ah uh, what i am no accomplished person and a companion to you must be that oh not necessarily not but i can't help using rural words sometimes when i don't mean to never mind i shall like to know them and oh i know i shan't do she cried with a distressful laugh i accidentally learned to write round hand instead of lady's hand and of course you want some one who can write that well no what not necessary to write lady's hand cried the joyous elizabeth not at all but where do you live in casterbridge or rather i shall be living here after twelve o'clock to-day elizabeth expressed her astonishment i have been staying at budmouth for a few days while my house was getting ready the house i am going into is that one they call high place hall the old stone one looking down the lane to the market two or three rooms are fit for occupation though not all i sleep there to-night for the first time now will you think over my proposal and meet me here the first fine day next week and say if you are still in the same mind elizabeth her eyes shining at this prospect of a change from an unbearable position joyfully assented and the two parted at the gate of the churchyard end of chapter twenty